Did you know that even when we are faithless, God remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. Stay tuned as we discover the faithfulness of God. Praise the Lord. My name is Ricky Burge, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Karis Daily. Today, we're going to be talking about the faithfulness of God. You know, I found that a lot of people have an, an impression of God that, hey, when you sin, he'll just walk away from you, or when you sin, he'll turn his back on you, or if you're disobedient, or if you don't do everything perfectly, um, if you don't meet the standard or uh, the criteria, then somehow God's, you know, not going to be there for you. He's not going to answer your prayers. He's not going to protect you. He's not going to do, you know, A, B, C, right? And But that's not the truth. The Bible depicts God as a faithful God. The Bible speaks of his nature as, as it's, it's in his nature to be faithful. And so his faithfulness is not dependent upon us. It's dependent on who he is. And so I like to actually start off in 1 Peter chapter 4, and we'll read verse 19. It says, therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. It's talking about we suffer according to the will of God. We are persecuted for being godly in an ungodly world, doing good and being godly is the will of God. I think we would all agree to that. But what happens when you live, when you're being godly in an ungodly world? What happens when you're doing good in a fallen and corrupted world? What happens is you become uh, being godly is criticized more than is celebrated in our culture today. And so when we suffer according to the will of God is when we're criticized instead of being celebrated, when godliness is, is, is looked down upon instead of being uh, something that we champion. And even in 2 Thessalonians, Paul talks about this in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. God could have destroyed the world. He could have destroyed the human race. He could have started over. In fact, in my logic, I would say it would be easier because now we have billions of people that have lived in the world. But when God, when Adam and Eve fell, it was only two. You know, our logic would probably say it would be easier. God just destroy them, condemn them, kill them or whatever, and start over and make a new world. And that way you don't have to worry about all of these different things. But the Bible says that God is a faithful creator, meaning he was faithful to Adam. He was faithful to Eve, even though they were not faithful to him. He was faithful to creation. He's faithful to all of the descendants, all of us who came from Adam and Eve. God could have just thrown us away, but he was committed to his creation. So much so that he became one of his creation. So even when God's creation wasn't what it, it, he originally created to be, he still uh, uh, remained faithful to this creation, even though it's, it's fallen, it's corrupted, it's flawed. It's not what he envisioned in his heart. It's not the good thing that he created. It's now become something different. Well, instead of just discarding it and throwing it away and saying, ah, it's not what I wanted. I'm just going to get rid of it. God said, I'm still going to remain faithful. He is a faithful creator. In Revelation chapter 13, verse eight, it says, uh, all who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So here's God. He already knows what's going to happen. He knows what redemption is going to cost. And he created us anyway. Be from the foundation. It says he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So, so when did Jesus decide to die on the cross for us? When did he decide to become one of us and, and suffer as he did? He decided it in the foundations of the world. 
He decided it right from the beginning when he was creating the world. So in his heart, all the way through, he already knew exactly what was going to happen. And he still decided to move forward with creating us anyway. It means that we are worth creating. It means that we have value. It means that God loves us. And it means that God is committed to us because it's like if you got married to someone, what would happen if you got married to someone? And before you said, I do, they told you, hey, I'm going to cheat on you. I am not going to be faithful. I am not going to just get only give myself to you. I'm going to give myself to whoever I want. Would you and I still say I do? I know for me, I would never say that, right? Because when I'm entering a covenant with someone, I want them to be faithful. I want them to be committed to me. And, and they want me to be committed to them. But God says he in the foundations of the earth, when he was creating us, he knew that Adam and Eve would eat of the tree. He knew that billions of people would turn their backs on him. And he still decided to continue anyway. That is a testament to the faithfulness, the faithfulness of God. In Second Timothy, chapter two, verse 11 to 13, it says, this is a faithful saying. For if we die with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. His faithfulness is not conditional. It's not only that he has unconditional love, that he loves without conditions or that he loves when we don't meet the conditions, but he's faithful uh, without conditions. He's faithful to us even when we don't meet the conditions, even if we may break the covenant, even if we don't keep our end of the agreement, God remains faithful. So his faithfulness isn't a response to ours. Even if we are faithless, the Bible says that he still remains faithful. And it says he will not deny us because he cannot deny himself. So what does that mean? It means that Faithfulness is God's nature. It's he can't deny himself for God to not be faithful would be for him to not be God. It's his very nature. Just like God is love. God is faithful. He is a faithful creator. He is a I'm going to stick with you until the end. He is a I'm going to see it through till the end kind of God. He is not the God that picks up and leaves when he, something doesn't happen that he that he doesn't like or something isn't going the way that he thought it would go or something, someone we're not acting the way we should, or we're not keeping up our end of the relationship. He's not the kind of God to just walk away. He's the kind of God to stay there with us and take the mistreatment, take the humiliate, take all of that stuff and to stay with us because he is a faithful creator. He cannot deny us because he can't deny himself because it is in his nature to be faithful. Even when we are faithless, he remains faithful. And he, because he cannot deny him. His faithfulness to us, his faithfulness to you is not based on what you've done. It's not based on, are you praying enough? Or are you praying correctly? Are you worshiping enough? Are you doing enough? Are you reading and studying? Are you holy enough? Uh, his faithfulness has nothing to do with you or I. His faithfulness is 100% dependent upon who he is. It's based on his integrity. It's based on his stick to itness, if that's a word, right? It's based on his heart and his posture that this is the kind of God that I am. And even though you might be faithless, that doesn't change who I am. That doesn't change how I interact with you because I'm not going to allow your faithlessness to change my faithfulness. No matter what you do, I'm still going to be faithful because I'm still God and I'm a faithful creator. And in Romans chapter three, verse three to four, it kind of reinforces this same idea. It says, for what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. So even if Israel didn't believe God's promises, God's promises were still true. God's promises were still there. And it's the same for you and I today. Uh, Whatever is happening in our lives, we need to know that God is not the problem. God is ever faithful, right? It might be the devil. It might be my unbelief. It might be fear. It might just be living in a fallen world. It might be all kinds of things that could affect certain things in my life. But we have to know that it's not God. God is 
the one constant in our life. If, if we can't depend on anybody and we can't depend on anything, he is that one person in our life that we can always depend on and who will always be there. The Bible says that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Never means never. Under no circumstance, under no conditions, there's nothing that can happen to make me leave you or forsake you. There's nothing you can do to make me leave you or forsake you. He told his disciples, he said, lo, I will be with you until the end of the age. That's the, 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 when God speaks, he speaks covenant language because he's a covenant God. When he says, I'll never leave you or forsake you, that's, that's how, that's how covenant people speak. You can always depend on me. I'll always be in your corner. And even if you're faithless, guess what? I'll still remain faithful because my faithfulness to you isn't based on you. You may go up and down based on how you're feeling, based on what's happening in your life, based on how, how, um, how well or not well you're doing, but God doesn't go up and down. He doesn't go in and out. He's constant. He's steady and he's consistent in our lives. And so it's the same thing with circumstances as well. We don't just say, let God be true and let every man be a liar, but we can also say, let God be true and let every symptom be a liar. Let God be true and let every financial challenge be a liar. Let God be true and everything that contradicts his promises and his goodness in my life, what I know to be true about God, let God be true and let all of those contradictions be a liar. We have to see the faithfulness of God through the different challenges of life in spite of the different challenges of life. And so Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, it says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said it and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? So here's the thing is that men lie, men change their minds, men disappoint. A man might say something to you today and he forgets what he said yesterday, tomorrow. Like he doesn't even remember what he said to you. Like he just, like that's how people can be. Sometimes we cannot depend on people. People are not the best example to represent God. But unfortunately, Many of us do see God through our human relationships. We see God through our father or our parents, or we see him through our authority figures in the world. And so what we have to do is we have to separate who God is from who man is. And we have to allow God to reintroduce himself to us independent of whatever relationships that we've had before. We cannot limit our understanding uh, and our relationship with God to our experiences that we've had with people, whether they be good or bad, because there's been some great people. We've had Abraham, we've had Elijah, we've had David, we've had Paul, we've had Peter, we've had great people, but as great as they were, they still were not God. As good as someone may be in your life, they are still, God is still so much better than they are. And so we cannot see God through people. We have to see God separate from people, independent of people. And we have, we have to give him the chance to show us who he is independent of all of this stuff. Proverbs 20 verse six says, most men will proclaim each his own goodness, but who can find a faithful, a faithful man? And so what, what we need to know is that we can count on God when we can't count on anyone else. God is not a man. He is not subject to the things that men are subject to. He's not affected by sin. He's not affected by being embarrassed or humiliated or, or, or uh, wanting selfishness or insecurities or any of those type of things. He is not affected. He is altogether separate from that. And that's what it actually means when we say that he's holy. Holy means that he's separate. He's, he's, he's exclusive. There's no one like God. And so we cannot have different experiences and we bring the, cause that's what a lot of times I've done in my life. I've taken the different experiences that I've had with family, with friends, with whatever. And I bring, unconsciously many times I bring that into my relationship with God and it hinders me from connecting with him. And so I've had to learn that God is not a man. He doesn't lie. He doesn't change his mind. If he said it, he'll do it. If he spoke it to me, he will make it good. He's not a man. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a faithful creator. And so um, if we look at Hosea chapter one, verse two, here's a great example of the faithfulness of God illustrated through the relationship between Hosea and Gomar. So in Hosea chapter one, verse two, it says, when the Lord began to speak by Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, 
Go, take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry, for the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. So here's God saying, hey, go take yourself a wife and just know that she's going to be a harlot and she's going to give you children out of that harlotry. And so Hosea's covenant relationship with this woman, Gomer, it was symbolic of God's covenant relationship with Israel. And since he's the same God and he doesn't change, you can also say with the church. And so God wanted to illustrate two things to us. Even though uh, he was being cheated on by his people, he made a covenant. They were, they were covenant breakers. They would go after different gods. They would not keep the commandments, all of this stuff, right? God was saying, even though you're breaking the covenant, I am not going to break the covenant with you. I am going to hold on to you. I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to stay by your side. He wanted to know that even though we cheat on him, he's never going to cheat on us. And even though we have brought grounds for divorce, that God's never going to divorce himself from us. When Adam and Eve sinned, God stuck with them and he's sticking with you. He's sticking with me. He's sticking with humanity. The cross is God saying that I'm sticking with you. The cross is God saying that I didn't just create you. I'm, I'm, a, I'm faithful to what I've created. I'm going to honor all my covenant that I've made with you. And Hosea, her, uh, his name actually means salvation or deliverer. And Gomer, her name means complete or completion. And so today we can say that Hosea is a picture of Jesus. Gomer is a picture of the church. And so even though God see, uh, even though, you know, we may not be as we ought to be today, God still sees us as complete. He still sees us as perfect. I know that I'm a work in progress. I know that I don't do everything perfectly. I know that there's a lot of areas where I need to grow and I need to get better. But the truth is that when God sees me, he sees me complete. He sees me uh, though, as I ought to be. And uh, I need to accept that, that God, even though I'm, I'm a work, the, there's a scripture that said in Hebrews chapter two, that says he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are one. Therefore, he is not ashamed to call us his brethren. I'm being sanctified. He's already holy. I'm becoming holy. He's already holy. But to get, we are one. And therefore, he's not ashamed to identify. It's the same thing with, with Hosea here. Like, hey, Gomar's being sanctified. She's, she's becoming holy. She's not holy right now. In fact, she's sleeping with other people, breaking the covenant. But I'm not ashamed to call her my wife. This is the same thing that God is saying to us is that he's not embarrassed by us or humiliated by us. He's not ashamed to call us one or to even be one with us. And God's, God's focus is so eternal that he he can interact with us now already seeing where we're going to go. He can already see the end from the beginning. He can already see these things. And so his love never fails. I think God's plan, if I could put it in one sentence, is that God's plan is to love everybody until they love him back. That's God's plan. He's going to keep loving you, keep seeking after you, keep uh uh believing for you, keep doing everything that he can until he wins your heart. And, and that's what he did with me. I know I was a complete heathen, but God pursued me and he pursued me and he pursued me until he captured me. And now today I'm his. In Hosea chapter three, verse one to two, it says, then the Lord said to me, go again and love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel who looked to other gods and loved the raisin cakes of the pagans. So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and a half homers of barley. I'm glad we don't use shekels and barleys anymore. But God, Gomer gave herself to another man while she was still married to Hosea. And it was so bad uh, that she actually became the property of another man. So I'm, I'm not sure how she, it, it became like this, but it was really bad. She became a, basically a slave or a sex slave to this man. She was his property. He says, go and, and redeem her and go and buy her for yourself. So the, the, the instruction is go and love someone who doesn't love you back and go and love someone who loves someone else. And so Hosea actually paid for her freedom of this unfaithful and undeserving wife. He paid for that freedom. He bought her freedom and she was undeserving. She was unfaithful, 
but Hosea was faithful to her. And so he refused to leave her in bondage and in the prison of her own making. She had built, made this bed and any man would have made her to just sleep in that. You, you, you've been out playing the harlot. Whatever you've done, you've become the property of this person. I'm just going to divorce you and go about my business. But the Bible says that he went and he bought her, not just back, but he bought her back to himself. You know, and, and that's important because he, he actually did love this person who didn't love him back. He actually was faithful to this person who wasn't faithful to him. And that's the same love that Jesus has showed us. The cross is Jesus embracing a similar kind of humility coming down here. It says that he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. They spit in his face. They mocked him. They, 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 they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. This is the faithful creator coming down to, to reintroduce himself to his creation, to bring them back to himself. And they're spitting in his face and they're mocking him and they're saying, crucify with him. Give him the worst death you can possibly give him. And so the Bible says that he embraced the shame. He embraced the humiliation. He embraced all of these things. And he literally paid for us, not with shekels and barley, but he paid for us with his very own life. He paid for, he bought us back with his very own blood and he refused to allow us to stay in a prison of our own making. He refused to allow us to stay in this place of bondage. He's bought us back. He's repurchased us from our adversaries and from our oppressors. And, and he's brought us back to himself to a place where he, we can be loved, we can be restored. And even in our unfaithfulness and even in all of that stuff, we can be we can be made whole once again. And that is a picture of the faithfulness of God. In Psalms 119, verse 89 to 90, talking about the faithfulness of God's word, it says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You establish the earth and it abides. So how do I know that God's word is true? Because he spoke in the beginning and he has not had to speak again. The same word that established the earth when he says, let there be light and all that, that same word is what causes it to abide. And so the faithfulness of that same word is experienced in every generation. God isn't having to speak every time a new generation comes. He spoke in the beginning and that same word that created the earth is still causing the earth to abide. So that means every time the sun comes up, every time I see the moon and the stars, I feel the wind. I can be sure that God's word is still true because he's not speaking actively to make those things happen. What he spoke thousands and thousands of years ago, that same word is still at work causing the earth to abide. And so the same word that said, let there be light is the same word that says, by your stripes, uh, by your stripes, I am healed. That same word says that I'm prospered and it says that I'm blessed and it says that I'm, I'm righteous and says that I'm holy and says that I'm forgiven and says that I'm loved. So that same word that said, let there be light and that's still causing the sun to rise and everything's in so uh, still in order. Um, that's the same word that speaks to me personally in my own personal life. And so just as the sun goes up every day, just as faithful as the sun is to go up, as faithful as that word is to heal me, to prosper me, to bless me, to forgive me, and everything else that God has said to me in my life. Psalms 89, verse 35 to 37 says that once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky. So just like the seasons come every year and the sun rises, the sun, all of that stuff, it's a faithful witness. Even creation itself tells me that the reason that the sun comes up faithfully is because it was created by a faithful creator. The reason why seasons come faithfully is because they were created by a faithful creator. And so in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, it says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Promises are only as good as the promise maker. And so God's promises are good because he is a promise keeper. So I want to encourage you today to hold on to your confession. Whatever you're believing for, whatever God has spoken to you, 
I need you to agree with God. I need you to say the same things that God says about you. Hold fast to your confession. Don't waver on what God has spoken to you. This is what um, Sarah did in Hebrews 11. It describes what she did in verse 11, that by faith, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. And so Sarah was 90 years old when she had that child and she held on to that promise. She did not waver at the promise. She did not, she did not allow that, that voice of unbelief to dominate her thought life, but she, she judged him faithful that the sun keeps coming up every day. The, the moon keeps coming up every night. There are stars, there are seasons, you know, God is a faithful creator. And so if he gave me a word, that same word that says, let there be light, that's the same power that's in the word that I am going to receive strength to conceive seed. That's how we receive the promises of God by judging him faithful. Even if it doesn't happen immediately, I still trust and believe that God is faithful. God is true and every man is a lie. God is true and every symptom is a lie. God is true and every contradiction is a lie. And so I just want to look at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 20 to 22. Jesus is the surety of the new covenant. It says, in as much as he was made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So by so much more, Jesus has become surety of a better covenant. Surety means certainty, assurance, or guarantee. Jesus was given to us as the guarantee of the new covenant. That's how faithful God is, is that he gave himself to actually be the guarantee of all the promises that you see in the new covenant. Everything that God has said in the new covenant is yours. And how do you know that it's yours? Because Jesus is the guarantee. Did he give himself for you? Yes. Then his words must be true. Did he die on the cross for me? Yes. Then his words must be true. In fact, in Isaiah 49 verse eight, it says, thus says the Lord in an acceptable time, I've heard you. And in the day of salvation, I've helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages. God gave himself to you as a guarantee that his promises are absolutely true and that he, he, he guarantees the new covenant. He backs up the new covenant by his very own life. And so if this blessed you, I just want to encourage you to call for prayer. Uh, we're, we got phone ministers standing by. They'd love to pray with you. They love to agree with you. They are seeing breakthroughs and miracles all of the time. 719-635. 1111. I encourage you to go to karisdailygtn.com because today we're actually giving away the true nature of God. This is Andrew's book about how God gave him a revelation of who his true nature is. You know, will the real God please stand up? This is Andrew's re um, revelation on uh, the old covenant, the new covenant. Sometimes it looks like God's killing people and then it looks like God uh, died for us. Which one is the true God? It will help you reconcile God's word so that you can see God for who he truly is. And so uh, we've got many other free resources and this program also runs seven days a week, Monday through Sunday. There'll be someone here to encourage you. God bless you and I'll see you next time.